Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 282, A History of the Woman. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, it's I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler. Holmes the busybody. Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. Ha! The game's afoot as we interview authors, editors, creators, and other prominent Sherlockians on various aspects of the great detective in popular culture. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts... Scott Monty and Bert Walder as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Well, hello and welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, I was wondering when I read that introduction if it should be the history of a woman. <laughs> Well, that's a very good question. And what are we going to do on International Woman's Day? Oh. You know, International that... Woman's Day is coming up, I think, in early March. We is that? Do... Yeah. We need to uh, extend this celebration of this discussion to that day honoring, uh, I think, is that? Well, on March is Women's History Month, but I think there's also a day that honors women and girls well, in science. Look, I too. think every day should be International Women's Day. Oh, how very politically I active do. of you to say that. <laughs> well, we have women to uh, thank for so much in this world. As a matter of fact, before the show started, you and I were talking about uh, a woman who made it possible for Sherlock Holmes to uh, join the world as he did. You, oh, you want, well. You want to give the amazing. audience a, a, a one-minute redux of that? <laughs> wow. One minute. Um, yeah. Go. You have 58 seconds. Time. Tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. The time tick, is tick, running tick, out. Tick, tock, tick, tock. I tick, tick, cannot tick, function tick, under these conditions. <laughs> tick, tock, tick, tock. Well, e no, I don't think I will. I think, okay. um, I think we'll just, we will just tease people and say, you know, we honor many people for the discovery of this and that. And there is someone that we can legitimately and seriously honor as the discoverer of Sherlock Holmes. And unsurprisingly, it is a woman. Mr. Beaton's wife. No, no, no. <laughs> what? No, no, no. Well, uh, but that's a tale for which the world is not yet ready. Not yet prepared. Well, we will make sure we address that. In a future episode, then. Well, this is going to be interesting because we're going to be talking about a very specific kind of woman, the woman, but not just any one the woman. It is a series of the women, and that is uh, women who have been honored by the Baker Street Irregulars over the course of the years and how that's changed. And we have someone with us who uh, is closely associated with that story, who tells us all kinds of tales from behind the scenes. That is Beverly Walloff. So you will want to stay tuned for this interview. Also, we should note that this is episode 282. Uh, it is dropping at the end of February. If you missed us in the last episode, our mid-month episode, we're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the scheduling gods were not with us, and unfortunately, we had to miss an episode 
this month. So well, now, now you really shouldn't shouldn't be promulgating these lies. Actually, just on trifles, we've just concluded an episode about secret societies, and our mid February episode <laughs> was done for you know one of our many secret societies. And so, if you haven't received it, if our listeners haven't actually noticed it, it's because you know you're not you're not in, in the society. You're, not, you're, you're not, not no, you're not in the group. Wow. But, uh, but there's hope. There's there hope. You hope. may. You may be admitted at some future point. <laughs> well, um, seeing that this is a leap year, it gives us an extra day in February to do our damage. Um, I'm, I'm sure we will more than make up for it in this episode. Yes, uh, well, and the other thing you can do if you miss that February 15 episode is just listen to this episode twice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, if you uh, want to make sure you are getting everything that uh, a subscription here comes with, just check us out at IHearOfSherlock.com. You can sign up for email updates so you don't miss a thing, even when there isn't a thing to miss. And you can support us on Patreon. Uh, the link is right there on the website or in our show notes. We have thank you gifts at various levels and a burgeoning community there. And I am told from Patreon that they are working on the web-based version of their, uh, their community section, which will allow us to have more discussions and more interaction with each other in one single place, which as an administrator for all of this would make it much easier on my part. So I hope mm. they, I hope they develop that really quickly. You can still do that right now, but it's only through the app. And um, it's it's limited. Um, so there you go. Hmm. So uh, before we get into the interview, I thought it might be helpful, uh, Bert, for you and I to talk a little bit about the history of the woman. Uh, so when we pick up our conversation with Bev, it's uh, it's kind of seamless. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Well, part of this was inspired by the 2022 Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual. A lady ventures into sacred precincts, women on the periphery of the BSI 1940 through 1960. Mm -hmm. And I think that 20-year period is important because it isn't until 1961 that we discover the, um, the official custom that was formalized by Julian Wolfe in 1961 uh, mm -hmm. when he invited two ladies to the, uh, the BSI dinner. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in that case, um, there was, uh, there were, there, they, were, they were only toasted before the dinner. They didn't take part in the dinner proceedings uh, themselves. So uh, there was a, a, a first irregular toast that was delivered to a certain gracious lady, Mrs. Edgar W. Smith. And, um, of course, Edgar had passed away the year before. Mm. And then uh, the first canonical toast was given to uh, Mrs. James Montgomery, the woman. And uh, that, of course, would have been... Uh, Jim Montgomery, who did the Christmas annuals in the 1950s, a series of Christmas annuals, he passed away suddenly just before Christmas of 1955. Mm -hmm. And his wife made sure that all of the annuals that he had prepared that year were still mailed out. She had a handwritten note to everyone with their annual. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was really how the modern era began to take root uh, and and. What we're talking about here is giving a little history in the 20 years leading up to that. Mm. Well, over the years, you know, particularly in the early days, I mean, just to remind our listeners, the Baker Street Irregulars formalized itself, you know, in the middle 1930s. There were women who were indisputably connected to Sherlock Holmes and deeply knowledgeable about the canon and the characters. And some of these women were participants in the crossword puzzle that Felix Morley had written and that Christopher Morley had published, which was introduced to the world as sort of an entrance exam for the Baker Street Irregulars. And some of the women who were 
participants in that and who successfully completed the puzzle were honored later. But around 1942, it was impossible to miss Edith Miser. Edith Miser had been uh, the writer of many of the radio programs. Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce had uh, done about Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And she was indeed a great Sherlockian. And so in 1942, she was uh, invited to the cocktail part of, of that early Baker Street Irregulars dinner and toasted as the woman. But we don't really know much more about that. And, you know, there were a couple of other people in the 1940s Gypsy Rose Lee, who was a performer, had written a detective novel, and she occupied the post of the woman at the dinner in 1943. And, uh, you know, a number of other women up through the 1950s uh, similarly participated. Before, as you say, Julian formalized the custom in the very early 1960s. Yeah, and uh, it's worth noting that Edith Miser... And uh, Catherine McMahon, I believe, was uh, one of the other names. Uh, she, the, the two of them received an investiture in 1991 mm. uh, by Tom Sticks, the first time women were given uh, shillings to be part of the BSI. And because they were uh, so heavily involved early on, or at least Catherine McMahon was one of the solvers of those puzzles and uh was a i think she worked in a bookstore uh for a number of years mm. um, as a matter of fact here's here's an interesting thing mcmahon had the opportunity to see basil rathbone in person uh she was standing on a friend's toilet and looked through the window saw rathbone in his bed <laughs> removing his teeth <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she relocated to Albuquerque in 1948, where I'm sure she uh, came into contact with uh, John Bennett Shaw. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, she was one of those original crossword puzzle solvers who later became an investitured member of the BSI. Hmm. But uh, that kind of brings us up through the, the 50s and early 60s, so let's enter our conversation with Bev to talk about where the women have gone since then. Bev Walloff, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So just uh, so we have a grounding, and, and our listeners do, tell us about the first time you met Sherlock Holmes. Oh, um, I was 14. I was in ninth grade. We were assigned the story of the Redheaded League, and I was fascinated. Um, who was this Sherlock Holmes guy anyway? I didn't know where to find additional stories. I, I just had that one story, and I was intrigued. The next time I met Sherlock Holmes, I was a sophomore in college, and a guy who I was dating gave me um, a copy of the canon. And I just read it from beginning to end. I was fascinated by it. Although I will have, to, I will tell you that at the period, at the point when I was reading The Hound of the Baskervilles, I was visiting a friend of mine. She went to Barnard and I was staying overnight in sort of like this ante area between rooms. And I had a cot and I get to this really scary part of The Hound. And I, Wanted to go to sleep, but I didn't. But I had to get off the cot to go turn the lights off. And I was afraid to get off the cot because I was convinced something was under the cot that was going to grab me. And I think I slept the entire night with the lights on because I couldn't get off the cot. But that was the beginning. And then um, I went from college right into a graduate program um, on uh, psychiatric art therapy. And I would come home at the end of the day, and I was just exhausted. I'd been with patients. I'd been at lectures, whatever it was. And my dad gave me, um, first he gave me a copy of the the, the canon. I forgot the, the first thing, the guy who lent me the, 
gave me the stories when I, in my, when I was a sophomore, it was just alone. My father actually gave me a copy, which has a sweet inscription in it. And then about a year later, I asked him for the annotated, and he gave me that as well. So that's what got me started reading. It's Michael Keane's fault that I got involved with organizations. This is Philadelphia. I, I was in the suburbs of Philadelphia. And Michael Keane, and I believe it was Bob Broderick, were doing a little bit of a chat about this group called the Master's Class. And they did it very late on Saturday nights after a Basil Rathbone movie was shown. Now, my late husband, Ra, was definitely not into Sherlock Holmes. But, you know, they came up once, twice, whatever it was. He said, write to them. Go write to them. So I did with great shyness. And I got a uh, an invitation back from Michael to hear some kind of a lecture. And I was like, oh, my gosh, do I go? Ra kept saying, do it, do it. You're interested. I said, fine. So I went and I met Michael, heard the lecture. Then people were gathering words to get something to eat. And I did this sort of thing. I mean, I just didn't go out with strangers, but I did. And I'm sitting next to this guy who seemed very sweet. And I tried so hard to engage him in conversation. And he would not say a word. He would barely look at Michael. And, you know, I had asked him, you know, he was a, a college student, I think, at the time, or maybe he was in law school. I don't even remember. But he disappeared. Um, so there's two parts to this. This was maybe in the spring of 1976. And I was married in August of 1976. And when I came back from my honeymoon, there was a letter waiting for me from Michael Keane, inviting me to be on the board of the master's class. And I was so excited about it. And I remember going to the first meeting, which was at Michael's house. And they greeted me as, oh, Miss Silverman is here. And I went, um, 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 it's not Miss Silverman anymore. And oh, my God, the drama that went on. Oh, she's no longer available. You know, all this kind of stuff. And they were making a big show about it. It was really very funny. But that's how I got involved with organizations. I finally, finally, finally. Some years later, found, saw again the guy who had sat next to me at this little dinner, and I recognized who it was, and I went, you? And he looked at me, and he said, yes, it was Andy Peck, who was <laughs> so afraid of me, he could not speak. So Andy and I became really good friends, but that's how I got started <laughs> into the world of Sherlock Holmes. Um <laughs> And I knew nothing. I didn't, you know, I would go to these meetings and they talk about the BSI and I was going, what's a BSI? You know, and I had no idea. And they were talking about this weekend in January. I knew nothing. I was so green. Now, just so our listeners know, um, Andy Peck is an Appellate Court judge. Was. Um, I think he's retired. Was. He's retired he? now, of course. Uh, but he also uh, wrote a key uh, chronology in conjunction yes. with Wes Klinger called The Date Being. He's a wonderful collector uh, and, and a wonderful Sherlockian and a member of the BSI. So, um, well, and also I would say Andy's made, you know, remarkable progress over the years since meeting <laughs> Dev. He's now perfectly capable of having a two, three minute conversation with people. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sometimes four, sometimes five. There you go. Come a long um, way. So, so just the spec has come a long way. He, he certainly <laughs> has. We're very proud of him around. Yes, the yes, yes, yes. So you're in the master's class, which is a local group in Philadelphia. You discover the Baker Street Irregulars and what that's all about. Now, of course, back in those days, this was pre-1991, when the BSI opened its doors to women, it was an all male affair. So talk to us about your understanding of the BSI and, and what you know a, a woman such as yourself might uh, have as far as interactions with them. Well, that's where it gets interesting because I have to relate it at some point to Peter and how I met him. It's Good. a little bit of a long tail and it doesn't start with him exactly. So bear with me. We're not going anywhere. 
to me, it's a fun story. All right. So I already mentioned Rob and I got married in August of 1976. We were living with his mother. She was not supposed to be there, but she was and had left the way she was supposed to leave. And Shirley was not happy that I had married her son and was giving me a very hard time. And it took a long time for Rob to figure out what was going on, but that's beside the point. On this one particular Saturday morning, Rob says to me, let's go for a jog. And I wasn't a jogger, I was a walker, but I said, fine. So we just, we got in the car, we went down. Philadelphia has, on either side of the Schuylkill River has drives. And we parked on one side and we got out, yada, yada, yada. And Rob jogged off and I walked for a little while. And then I decided it was getting warm. It was the end of April, yada. And um, I went back to the car and I was sort of dozing. And all of a sudden I hear this car door slam. And it was, I heard Rob's voice thanking somebody for the ride. And I thought, this is really strange. And he had stepped in a hole and it had flipped his foot and he had broken his ankle. And another runner found, yeah, another runner found him, went and got his car, drove him back to us. Now, at the time, Rob was doing a residency in orthopedics, as a matter of fact, at a hospital in Philadelphia. I drove him up there and, you know, we dealt with it. We had left the house at about 10 o'clock in the morning. It is now three o'clock in the afternoon. I drive up to the house. I'm helping Rob. He only had a straight path to walk up in one step, one step. He tripped, he's flat on his face. And the house is a ranch, so he had like five steps he had to get up to get to the bedroom. And he just looked at me. Rob, I have to tell you, was brilliant. At that moment, he couldn't think how to get up the steps. He certainly wasn't gonna do it with crutches. So he said, honey, turn around, sit on the steps and sort of hunch yourself up. So he did that. We got him upstairs. I got him on the bed. I had pillows underneath him. Everything was quiet. This mirror spontaneously leaps off the wall, crashes to the ground. I get a (laughs) box. I put the glass in the box. At this point, the master's class was supposed to have its very first wine and cheese that evening. And I looked at Rob and I was in charge of bringing soda because I was the only one in the group that didn't drink. And I looked at Rob and said, I don't want to go. I'm exhausted. He said, no, no, go. He said, it'd be good for you to be with friends. He said, I hate to say it. If I need anything, my mother's here. You should go and get out of the house. So I borrowed from Shirley a styrofoam picnic basket. I put the bottles of soda in. Those days they were still glass. I packed some ice around it and I went. I get there. I'm standing in, it was like in a community room of an apartment building. And I'm standing in the doorway trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. It was the first time we had ever done this. And I'm standing there trying to figure out what do I do? And the handle separated from the picnic basket and goes crashing down. And I, all of a sudden, I am surrounded by broken glass. And I'm just looking at it because I didn't know what else to do. And Marv Aronson, who was then chief medical examiner for the Philadelphia police, must have seen the look on my face. And he came over and he gently starts to take me away, pulls my arm and takes me away. And I'm going, but, but, but he said, someone else will clean it up. So he found a chair for me and I sat down. People were socializing. And the idea was that Mike King got up at some point and said, we have some people, you know, introductions or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, This man, Peter Blau, gets up. Now, this is what I knew about Peter Blau. I have been attending these master class meetings, and the plan was to have this dinner on the Sunday of the BSI weekend. Not that I knew anything about the BSI weekend, because the rationale was that people from New York would come down. Philadelphia wasn't so far away. They could go back. People from Philadelphia could go from New York to go to the dinner whatever. People from Washington could stop in Philadelphia and then go on. That's what we were discussing. And they kept saying, if Peter Blau comes, it's like an endorsement. If Peter Blau comes, other people will come. If Peter Blau comes, everyone will know about it and they will want to be there. I listened to this for the first meeting, the second meeting. (laughs) They came up with a third meeting. And finally, I said, Who is this Peter Blau anyway? What did I know? And the way he was described to me, it was that he was this incredible intellectual who had a collection to kill for 
and that he had had half of the women in Washington. This is what I knew about Peter Blau. Which half, well, Peter, by the way? I, I really don't know. Didn't ask. Oh. Anyway, Peter actually didn't come to the January dinner. His father had passed away. But now we're in April. We're having this wine and cheese. He's been introduced by Michael King. He gets up there and he's talking about the cardboard box. John Lanzalotti, who was a plastic surgeon based, yeah, based in Williamsburg, had created for Peter his version of the cardboard box. He had made the ears out of wax and he made the little box and he'd given to Peter as a gift. And Peter's up there talking about it. And much to my amazement, I, who was sitting there so exhausted and frozen, was laughing. He was really funny. When it's all over, uh, we get up and start to separate. And someone comes over and says, would you like to meet Peter Blau? And I went, sure. So she takes me over and makes the introductions. And Peter automatically takes this box out of his pocket and said, would you like to see what's inside the box? And I'm standing there looking at him and thinking, I don't want to see one more broken, dismembered anything. And I smiled sweetly and I said, no, thank you. <laughs> and he's and he's just looking at me and he's he proffers it closer to me, you know, on his hand. He said, No, no, you really want to see this. And I'm thinking, what part of no thank you didn't he get? So I said, I, I held up a hand, so he, you know, universal stop sign. And I said, No, thank you. And I took a step backwards. Well, Peter's not used to hearing no, and he takes a step toward me. And he's still holding the box out <laughs> toward me. And he said, no, he said, you really want to see it? It's beautifully done. And I'm looking at him and going, I take another step backwards, hands up again. I go, no, thank you. The bottom line was he backed me up all the way around this humongous <laughs> pillar until we wound up back where we had started. He finally figured out I really didn't want to see this cardboard box. He slipped it back in his pocket. I will tell you that cardboard box is in his library. I have still never seen the contents and I have no plans to, but that's how I met Peter Blau. <laughs> and he would show up, he would show up periodically at a master's class mm. event and I would chat with him. And um, about a year from then we invited the group from Pittsburgh to come to some kind of match of questions. And I don't even remember at this point. And uh, so Peter was there for a whole weekend rather than a, an event for a couple of hours. And we really became friendly at that point. I remember he gave me his address and said, write me, write me a letter. Tell me what you're doing. And I was scared to do it. I was terrified of him. You know, the great Peter Blail. Great Peter. And Rob kept saying, yeah, he said, do it. You know, he kept, and Rob kept encouraging me. So I finally wrote Peter a nice letter and son of a gun, I got a postcard back. And I remember getting the postcard out of our apartment mailbox, waving it in the air and said to Rob, look, look, I got a postcard from Peter Blau. I said, you know, this souvenir. And Rob looks at me and says, write to him again. You'll get another one. I was like, no, no. I, am I entitled to more than one? He said, write to him. You'll see what happens. I wrote to and son of a gun, another postcard came back. And that started our correspondence. Um, and over time, obviously, you became very good friends. And obviously, at this point, having now living with him now for we're in our 21st year, um, more than very good friends. Um, and such is our history. Yay. Well, and you are <laughs> you are actually the first person uh, in my recent memory who has properly defined Peter Blau as the cross between Lorenzo de' Medici and the Delphi Oracle. <laughs> and, yes. And I think that's yes. very appropriate for our listeners. Well, I'm going to segue into something. You asked me about the BSI weekend. It took me a couple of years to decide that maybe this is something I wanted to do. And I knew I wasn't going to the BSI dinner, but I also knew about the Ash dinner. And so I sort of made a weekend for myself. I became very friendly with women of the ash in the ash. And, and, and so that was fine. And Rob was more than happy to let Peter be my escort. Um, you know, we knew, he knew I'd be safe with Peter. He was very much the gentleman and that way he was off the hook. He didn't have to go. It wasn't something of interest to him. 
And so it continued along those lines. I told Peter once I found about found out about the woman that I wanted. I think I'm the only one possibly in the history of the BSI that actually said, I want to be named the woman. And Peter said, it's not going to happen. And I said, no, no, I'm a Sherlockian. I, 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 there's no reason why I couldn't be the woman. He said, it's because Rob's not a Sherlockian and it always goes to the spouse of someone who's active. It's sort of like a thank you to the guy and all those kinds of things. He said, you're not going to be the woman. And I bring it up every once in a while and it just wasn't going any place. Well, what happened for me is that um, Tom Sticks started naming women who I enjoyed seeing at the Ash Dinner into the BSI. They were no longer at the Ash Dinner. The Ash Dinner wasn't the same for me. And so for a couple of years, I just didn't go. I just didn't come up to the weekend. It just wasn't the same for me. And then in July of 1996, I got a call from Tom Sticks and said, would you do us the honor of being the woman for 1997? And my heart is pounding. And I went, oh, yes. And he said, terrific. He said, but there's one catch. I said, what's the one catch? He said, you can't tell Peter. <laughs> because the protocol at that time, and I don't know what it is anymore. The protocol is that the husband didn't know. It was supposed to be a surprise to him as much to everybody else. Well, Rob didn't count. He wasn't going and he didn't care. But Tom wanted to sort of jerk Peter's chain just a little. I couldn't tell Peter. So I waited a day <clears throat> trying to figure out how to handle this. And I called Peter and I said, you know, I'm thinking maybe I'll go up for the weekend this year. Oh, that's wonderful. Tell me, you know, I haven't made, <clears throat> I haven't made up my mind yet. I'm thinking about it. I'll let you know. That's terrific. So I waited about two months. Have you made up your mind yet? Have you made up your mind yet? No, I haven't made up my mind yet. So around September, I said to him, yeah, I'm thinking maybe I'll do it. Oh, that's great. But I haven't decided completely yet. He said, well, you go to the Ash dinner. I haven't decided yet. So it's getting closer and closer. It's now November, December, something. And um, it came up one more time. I told Peter, yes, I'm going to go. Are you going to the Ash Dinner? No, I, I think I'm going to go to a show. There's someone who I work with who said she would come up to New York. We'd do a show together. She's going to see friends, but I'll be there for other things. That's terrific. So here we are in New York. Peter stops by my hotel room to show me how wonderful he looks in his tuxedo. I'm dressed in a very simple but long dress. He leaves. I snap on the jewelry. And the person who was presenting me was Ray Betzner. Ray knocks on my door. I'm ready to go. And we go. You're going to have to help me on this next part. The place where the dinner was taking place was... This is, well, this is 12, 12th Fifth Avenue, the, probably. Yes. Yes. Okay. 24. Yes. 24, 24 Fifth, Fifth Avenue. Avenue. And I'm standing, if you may recall, they had this little entrance way. It was freezing cold. And I'm standing there waiting patiently. And all of a sudden, Jack Coley's head pops outside the door. Now, I knew Jack Coley because I knew him from Philadelphia. And he goes, Bev, what are you doing here? I'll tell Peter. No, <laughs> Jack. No, no. But he disappears. And I'm stuck. I can't go after him. And he's gone. And I'm standing there waiting, waiting. And as Peter will tell the story, Jack comes up to him and says, I just saw Bev. She's standing in the, you know, in, in the entranceway. And, ja and Jack enjoyed his drink. And Peter figured that was the problem. And he says to Jack, no, no, Bev's not here. She's at the theater. And Jack goes, no, no, she's standing out there. And Peter, all of a sudden, I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, Peter's head pops outside, and he takes one look at me, and he gets this big grin, because then he knew what was happening. Aww. And finally, they came to get me, and he was so pleased. 
And there's a piece of me that's still in the back of my head goes, uh-huh, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to pause here a moment for a quick word from our sponsor. If you aren't yet signed up for email updates from MX Publishing, well, you're missing out. There are lots of freebies available for fans of MX Publishing that come out regularly. Every Friday, Steve MX sends out Thank Homes It's Friday. And the latest one has top picks of 2023. If you use the code 2023 at checkout, you'll be able to get a discount on some of these titles. And if you sign up for the email updates, you'll also have access to audio codes for free audiobooks from MX Publishing. Titles like Sherlock Holmes, The Coronet Conspiracy by James Patrick Heatherly, The Selected Cases of Dr. Watson by Martin Daly, and Sherlock Holmes and the Adventure of the Bedeviled Foot by Thomas Kent Miller. Also, you'll be the first to know about new titles as they're released in 2024. Titles like The Devil at Prayers by Elora Lawthorne, Sherlock Holmes and the Barnyard Caper by Danielle Calloway, Sherlock Holmes Eliminate the Impossible by by Paula Hammond and Sherlock Holmes Five Miles of Country by Gretchen Altebeff. Make sure you're signed up for email updates from our friends at MX Publishing. Just go to mxpublishing.com and register today. Bev, help us understand a little bit about the history of the woman, because by the time you were honored with the title in 1997, it was in full swing. But uh, in the earlier days, uh, they they weren't spouses of Sherlockians. It was a stag event, certainly, um, but women were were honored. Tell us a little bit about the earlier days and some of those uh, those the women. Okay, it's interesting. I was looking Peter, of course, as Simpson, as the secretary, has all kinds of lists. And I asked him, I've asked him periodically for an updated list just because I want it. And what was interesting when I looked at the list recently, the first, I think it's six women, it's just their name, who the spouse was, and nothing else after that. It started with Peggy Nelson in 1967, was the first time a restaurant was mentioned. All the the women that came before her between 61 and and including 66, there's no restaurant. So I assume that the women were honored and they left. That was it. When you say restaurant, this is the later tradition that the women would gather together and go off to a restaurant on their own while the BSI dinner was happening. Yes, very much so. And the practice was that the woman who had been named the woman the year before was the one who acted as hostess. So she was the one who figured out the restaurant and invited other V women to come and join her. I have no idea how many women came, um, only that, it, it, you know, after that, that was it. And if you look at the list, you'll see the restaurants changed year after year after year after year. Uh, at some point, it got a little more consistent. I was, I thought I was going to have to arrange for a restaurant and I was informed that our dinner was going to be at the Algonquin, which is where those dinners were taking place at the time. In fact, what happened was something went wrong with the Algonquin's uh, uh, kitchen. And at the last minute, we had to hustle over to the Harvard club, make an arrangement with them we had a couple of women who stayed back to escort some of the more fragile the women over to the Harvard Club. And so uh, Mary Schultz, who was the person who came after me, who I was hostessing, you know, every, it, it, the whole thing was so upside down. I can't even begin to tell you. But after that, it wasn't the job of the woman of the year before to make an arrangement. It fell to the wife of whoever was in charge of the BSI. So 1997, I was the last person Tom Sticks chose. After that, it went to Mike Whalen. So Mary Ann was in charge 
And she was the one that was setting all of this up. And then it moved to Connie Keene um, when Michael Keene became head of the BSI. So that's how it's, it's kind of used now. Hmm. That's fascinating. Um, so tell us a little bit about what goes on at these dinners. I mean, we're uh-huh. familiar with the BSI dinners, with the ASH dinners, with you know some of the, the pomp and circumstance and agendas. And it's mm-hmm. always been fascinating to me to know that there's this wonderful coterie of, uh, of women, this alumni uh, group that gather together while we're having our dinner uh, and go off and you have your fun. But what happens there? Oh, well, <laughs> in the years, in, the, in my early years, we would be a fairly small group, maybe eight women. OK, there was no program. We chatted. We would sort of go around the table. What did you do this year? Anything special? All that kind of thing. And the person who had been the year before me was Barbara Herbert. And Barbara Herbert and I found each other and talk about two kids, two gigglish girls off in a corner. We didn't care about the <clears throat> the older, perhaps more senior ladies. Barbara and I were having our own gab fest and they'd be talking about something and Barbara and I would be laughing about something. I mean, she and I were a pair. <clears throat> well, Mary Ann figured this out kind of quickly. And there were name, you know, uh, little things with your name on it. And she kept splitting Barbara and me up. At first, Barbara was sitting at least across the table from me. And then it was Barbara was across the table from me down at the other end. She was trying to split us up. And she kept sitting me next to Ad Osler. And Ad Osler was a journalist, a very intelligent woman. And she came to the dinners. I'm not sure how she felt about them. I tried so hard to engage her in conversation. It's one of the things I'm like actually Andy usually... Peck all over again. It was like Andy Peck all over again. And I tried asking her about her work. Got very short answers. She just... I was the youngest kid on the block, and she was not particularly interested. I finally figured out Ad Osler had a dog she adored. And so it got to be for several years in a row, Marion would put me next to Ad, and we discussed her dog. I finally found a way to get through this. In terms of what actually happened, it was always very casual. It started to change trying to remember, I think when Connie Keene came on board, I don't remember whether Marianne was part of this or not. Candy Lewis was very determined to have something that was more, more like the BSI dinner. And her background was in art history. She did a, um, a couple of lectures on art history, sort of engaged with Sherlock Holmes. And, you know, I understood I was an art history major kind of thing. I'm not sure how much, how other people quite fell, felt about it. Um, I myself did a talk about uh, Victorian fashions with a slide, you know, it was a PowerPoint, um, but I did it with humor, it was a little different, but there was, other than that, there was nothing really what I would classify as academic. We were just happy to chat. How was your, how are your kids? How were the grandkids? Where did you go? You know, all those kinds of things. Connie Keene brought in something different. It took her a couple of go-rounds to get on her feet, but she decided to establish more traditions. In fact, I just wrote a piece for the BSJ. It'll come out this spring on what the women dinner was like and where we are now. Um, We have our own toasts. We actually have one toast to V-Men. Uh, plus some of the other traditional toasts. And we have two other traditions that Connie decided to include. One is the reading of the poem that I wrote to be presented in January 1999 to the woman. And under Mary Ann, I wrote it, read it some years, not other years. Connie asked me every year to do it, and I do. And the other tradition was one that was introduced by Barbara Herbert to read uh, to read the poem that ends in, it's always 1895. And I know you're going to know which one that is. 
And those have become yeah. our, tra- yeah, it's those have become, our, thank it's you, thank seven. you. Yeah. Yes. And those have become our traditions. We still do a lot of, how was your year? How was your kids? How are, because we're friends. One of the things that I would, we're not a large group. Uh, we've gotten to know each other over the years. Um, we know each other's hobbies. We know, you know, traditions. We know what groups people belong to. And a little bit, I'll take credit. Peter thinks I should take credit. It's my fault. Because there was one year, it was after Connie was starting to be the hostess for the dinners. And she got in touch with me. And she had hurt. She wasn't coming. I don't remember whether she hurt a knee, a foot, a leg, or something, something. And she knows I have no problem standing in front of a group conducting a meeting. And she said, would you mind acting as hostess? And I said, no problem. But I made a decision because the year before in particular, as we went around the table, people were struggling trying to decide whether or not they were Sherlockians. Because for some of these women, if you haven't read all the stories, if you haven't memorized all the facts, Are you a Sherlockian? Does the fact that you helped in Janice Fisher's case is the fact that she worked with, you know, Steve on, you know, editing the BSJ. Is she a Sherlockian or not? Sharon Klinger said, I I work with Les on editing things for his book. Am I a Sherlockian or not? So I decided, since I, no one could stop me, that as we, (laughs) you're laughing, you you guys know me, um, that I didn't. The way I started the dinner, I said, if you want to talk about something you did this year as a Sherlockian, terrific. Happy to listen to it. But you don't have to. If you want to tell us about something you're doing, something personal, something you're going to do, we're all happy to hear it. And so we ran around the table and it was fascinating. I didn't know Sharon Dvorsky enjoyed gardening. She and her husband were going off on a gardening tour. We heard about somebody else who was struggling with a friend who was very ill. We heard about somebody's backstory. It was all kinds of things. Because, frankly, when I got to my turn all those years and they say, you know, what did you do, Sherlockian wise? My standard line line was my Sherlockian event this year was the care and feeding of Peter Blau. (laughs) And I was really tired of saying that because I was also a Sherlockian. I did Sherlockian things, but that's yeah. not what anybody really wanted to know. I mean, I've written papers, I've done presentations, I've done, you know, all kinds of things. The care and feeding of Peter Blau. That was my Sherlockian contribution. So um it's an important it's, one. It is an important one. And someone asked me to do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> let me, so let me ask so Go let ahead. me ask you a question. You know, um when we interviewed Otto Penzler. A long Mm -hmm. while ago, uh, I was curious because Otto has known so many Sherlockian, so many Sherlockian collectors. I was always curious to find out what he thought tied a collector personality together. And you have this sort of unique insight into the women. And I'm just curious, is there... What do you think the commonality of all this is? Because you're rather exceptional, as you just said, in yourself, you are an experienced Sherlockian. But if you're not, um, you know, if you are the spouse of someone who has a particular odd passion, um, you know, you can be loving and accepting of it, but that's a far cry from joining in. And sometimes when you're married to someone who's got an odd passion, you know, it can be vaguely annoying. It takes up a lot of time. It takes up a lot of (laughs) money. You don't really participate in it. They're sort of off on their own. They're in a different, they've got a different network, a different community. So, but what do you think about the community of the women? Are there things that you think tie them all together, that there are commonalities there? Well, if you ask Karen Gurian, Andy Peck's wife, she will tell you how much she does not like the fact that he's a collector. It's a running joke. Um, I think a lot of the women participate sort of on the side. Their husbands are involved. They get involved with the group. They get involved with the BSI weekend, whatever it is. Beyond that, there are women who have passions of their own. So they support the passions that their spouse has. 
in a step beyond that, we have our own friendships. And I'll give you a for instance. Kathy Maranker and I have become very close. Kathy doesn't collect anything Sherlockian. She's got, she is an internationally recognized quilter. Okay. But Kathy and I understand our partner's passions. We're in full support. And what makes me smile inside is that I remember when Kathy was named the woman, I thought it should have happened a little sooner, but okay, there we were. And I know the weekend she was being named, I guessed it. And she was really hesitating. What was this woman business, you know, kind of thing? She wasn't sure she wanted to be there. I mean, what are we, a bunch of sidecars? I mean, you know, come on. And I said, no, it's a really lovely, loving group of women. You're going to find friends. And I don't think she entirely believed me, but she came. She was a good sport. And then she started to discover that in a way, Maybe we don't have book collections. Maybe we're not collectors of any sort. But we are all women who understand our husband's passion. And one way or another, we support it. To that, that's the commonality that we have, is supporting someone who we love because they have something they love. And in Kathy's case in particular, and we talked with Glenn about this in his episode, mm -hmm. she's responsible for him starting to collect. So in many yes. ways, she was there for the origin story and for her to reap the reward of being honored now is the, the perfect bookend. Yes, yeah. it is. Very much so. But, well, I this is this is marvelous, Bev, because I think just the same way that we find uh, kinsprits within the Sherlockian community as Sherlockians ourselves. It's wonderful to hear that mm -hmm. there's the same kind of feeling and camaraderie that you get from this small band of women who, uh, you know, for no reason other than their undying support of one of their, uh, their significant other's passion, uh, are honored. And I, I wonder, and this is going to take us into the realm of speculation now, Bev, because we are now uh, co-ed in the BSI. Do you think there's a time not in the not too distant future when one of the women will be selected who may not be a woman at all, or perhaps is from a, uh, a same-sex relationship or something um, that we haven't seen in the past? I mean, someone, <clears throat> I'll tell you who ought to get it, excuse me, is Mike McCurris. You know, um, you know, I've offered, I've offered yeah. to, you know, I've said to Julie, we could put him in the dress. It's not a problem. <laughs> uh, not sure he'd be interested in that. There, you know, there maybe needs to be another subgroup for sporting, supporting spouses who are not BSI members. They are not the women. They need their own group. So, yes, I think they're. Should be a place. I mean, the Ash Dinner doesn't exist anymore. I don't know what Mike does. And I, I'm sure there are a couple of other spouses as well. I should tell you that the origin of this poem is that Mike Whalen called me up. Must have been October, maybe November. And I was starting to shuffle my feet and tell Peter I wasn't sure I wanted to go to the BSI weekend. Because Rob had his, I had lost Robin at the end of August. And I had because of the job that I had, I was then um, assistant director to the Jewish Community Center in Northern Virginia. And so I was in a very public position. And every time I'd walk out into the lobby, there would be somebody else who, quote unquote, wanted to comfort me. But you always wind up comforting the person who you're talking to. And it was very draining. And I knew that by coming up to the weekend, there were a lot of people who were just going to find out about Rob for the first time. And it was going to be a replay. And I wasn't sure I wanted to go through that. So Peter, being Peter, discussed this with Mike Whalen. And all of a sudden, I get this phone call from Mike saying that he would really like for me to write a poem honoring the woman. Would I do it? Now, Mike knew I could write. Peter definitely knew I could write. And I hesitated. And then I said, OK. So I had a couple of months to do this. And I'm what, you know, 
I'm not a seat of the pants writer exactly. I'm more of a layered writer. I'm like, I put it off, I put it off, and all of a sudden I go, oops, got a deadline, better figure this out. And I remember I kept a pad, a, a, you know, one of those lined pads that we have in the car with me. And as I was writing, as I went through my commute, I'd write down phrases. And then I think it was the Sunday before the weekend, I sat down and said, I better write this thing. <laughs> and I just put it all together. The first reading was actually at the woman dinner the night before on the Friday night. And then I read it at the reception on Saturday. And I got through it. I remember seeing Peter's head front and center smiling at me and smiling at me. He went to make sure I got through it. It was really kind of cute. And I did. I will tell you that when I read it, and it's even more so now, that it wasn't just the woman. I had Rob in mind and Peter in mind. So when I get to the very end of the poem, I tend to break up just a little bit. I always warn the women. They all know it. They don't worry about it. It's Bev. So if you would like, I'll read it to you. The Woman. Beneath the dainty bonnet are two frankly gazing eyes that bond men's souls to her for life. Therein the story lies. For the woman is embodiment of passion and finesse, of warmth, of strength, of insight her nature to possess. A balanced calm surrounds her as she radiates her charm. A smile, a glance, a knowing look, with humor she'll disarm. Supportive, nimble guiding, she lets others play the game. Perceptive, wise, but subtle, she has no need of fame. Imagination's champion, a gallant spirit still, to hold the lamp so patiently a romance to fulfill. For in her heart, she understands the way men's souls do dream. She honors his mind's fancy, a sign of her esteem. Who is this gracious lady, so modest yet so strong, that others seek to honor her and laud her praise in song? A liaison from past to now, a regal presence clear, a timeless portrait, counterpoint, selected from her peers. In 1961, it was with Julian acting host, the BSI Sherlockians first raised a glass and toast. And so the custom then began. They honor one each year. Oft times it's been a valiant wife or a scholar might appear. It really all goes back in time to 1887. Holmes met Irene Adler and had a glimpse of heaven for he saw beneath the bonnet those two frankly gazing eyes that bound his soul to hers for life. They're in the story lies. So this year was the 25th anniversary of the poem. And I made a souvenir, 50 copies. Um, the intent was it only went to the women. There are a couple of renegades out there. Um, <laughs> one, the funniest one to me was, sorry, I on the, web. the funniest one was Connie Keene came up to me at the reception and said very quietly, Michael has seen your souvenir. I went, okay. She said, he's, he's lusting for it, <laughs> lusting for it. <laughs> well, I felt I owed Michael Keene something because he got me into this mess with Sherlockians. So I happened to have a couple of extra copies in my hand. I went over and I said, Michael, this is for you. Another person to God is I sent two copies to Ray Betzner. <clears throat> the copies are all numbered. And the two that I sent him, one was in the 30s. I said that was for him to keep. I felt he had earned it. He was the one who had presented me as the woman. But um, I also gave him copy number 5050, the number 50 out of 50 copies. And I said, for the archives, and I let him choose. If he'd wanted the 50-50 one, I would have been fine, but that's the one that is going to the archives. And that's kind of it. So I still have a few left for future The Woman. Lovely. A fitting conclusion, Beth. Thank Lovely. you so much for sharing all of these stories with us. Uh, you, you're just a, you're a marvel. And uh, <laughs> it, it helps bring 
so much of this down to the personal level, which is, I think, what means the most to people. Bev, we will talk to you again soon. In the meantime, thanks so much for being here on I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Thank you very much. It's a wonderful conversation and a wonderful verse by Bev. How beautifully she captured the notion of supporting the passion of a spouse and the dynamics and the complexities of that affection and that relationship and what it implies for... um, both parties there, particularly for, um, you know, intelligent and, and perceptive women who uh, have a lot to contribute on their own. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad she had the opportunity to share that with us, and even more glad that she was also able to share some of those personal anecdotes, because this is, I think, the magic of being a Sherlockian, that so much of uh, I think what we enjoy isn't something that you can necessarily convey in writing or on paper. It, it's something that needs to be, I mean, you, you heard the enthusiasm in, in Bev's voice. You heard uh, the passion with which she spoke about this and the people she met and the, the, the clever asides and humor and all the rest. Um, absolutely marvelous to, uh, to hear that directly from Bev. Mm. I'm also, uh, we, we didn't get a chance to speak with her about this, but I'm also interested in, um, I think there's a, a certain dynamic that happens here with a very small number of women. I'm thinking particularly of Julia Rosenblatt, who was the woman in 1979, mm. and then Francine Morris, uh, who became Francine Morris Swift, I should say, mm. uh, the woman from 1983. These are women who later became invested members of the Baker Street Irregulars. And I, I just wondered how that works. I mean, do they still have an opportunity to go to the, uh, the dinner for the women? <laughs> or, uh, and, and, and how that shakes up the women uh, in, in terms of the dynamic at their dinner. Hmm. Well, it's a good question. Yeah. All right. Speaking of questions, <laughs> this is the perfect place to consider the questions that we have with respect to the canonical couplet. This is when we give you two lines of poetry and we ask you to give us the Sherlock Holmes story that we are talking about now if you were around here the last time way way back in episode 281 you'll remember we gave you this clue a christmas tale one of the best produced left the sad culprit permanently goosed (laughs) (laughs) oh bert yes yes do do you do you possibly can you possibly know the answer to this canonical couplet Oh, of course. It's one of the first of the adventures, you know, and it takes place deep in the winter. It's about the frozen salesman at an estate sale. It's the case Watson called the auctioneer's numb. Oh, man. (laughs) That hurts. Oh. <laughs> Ouch, quit it. No, unfortunately, not the auctioneer's numb. Oh, no. As usual, we'll go to our friend Eric Deckers, who uh, had some uh, something to say. He said, I think I can recover after last episode's poor showing. Go for it, Eric. It's the story where Holmes and Watson travel to Georgia and enjoy some of the down-home southern cooking. Filling up on Granny's famous pork stew. It's the adventure of the stewed pig knuckle. (laughs) 
<laughs> How much? What? Oh, boy. Uh, he said, no, no, actually, it's the adventure of the blue carbuncle. Yes, carbuncle that's what we were looking for. Mm. Uh, that is indeed what it is. So uh, we had a number of people who uh, submitted their uh, their recommendations, their suggestions for uh, the answer here. And I'm going to pull out the big prize wheel and give it a spin. <laughs> All right, going around and seeing that we land on number 24. Look at that, 24. And that looks like it is Brooke Hall. Congratulations, Brooke. We will have a prize to you. Uh, I don't, you know, it's been so long. I don't remember what we promised for the last prize. <laughs> Do you? What did we talk about in the last episode? I think we promised uh, a 1921 Bentley. I think. To, oh, uh, I, <laughs> shoot! I just yeah. gave mine away. Oh, uh, that's right. unfortunate, isn't it? No, it right. is a copy of Lori King's "The Lanterns Dance." Oh, of course, if yes, almost, almost. That's. Well, uh, I was going to say it? that's uh, yeah. that's just as good as a Bentley just at as this good. point. Absolutely. So, uh, Brooke, we will make sure we get a copy of that in the mail to you. So, thank you very much for uh, participating. And now, this time around, we have another canonical couplet. Uh, clue for you so stay tuned as we give it to you right now to trust a man inclined to laugh and fidget may mean the loss of an important digit if you know the answer to this episode's canonical couplet put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line if you are among all of the correct answers and we choose your name at random you'll win good luck all right I'm trying to think what we have for a prize this time around um uh, maybe I should send someone a woman <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't have an extra one lying around here, so it might be difficult. Well, 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 isn't that always the case? You it know, is. You need I a know. woman. You know, you just can't find one. <laughs> don't you have one of those little glass boxes on the wall where you break with a little hammer? In case of emergency? Yeah. No, I, there would be glass shattered all over my house if that were the case. <laughs> uh, the, the, I'm always in need of uh, of some good help by uh, mm. an intelligent and strong woman. Mm. Well, uh, Brooke, we will have... Uh, uh, not Brooke. The, for whoever wins this time around, we will we will get you something from the IHO's vaults. And if it happens to be uh, thematically aligned with uh, the woman, fantastic. Mm. We'll, uh, we'll let you know after we've had a chance to rummage through the hall closet without all of the stuff uh, coming down on us. Mm. Well, Bert, um, any big Sherlockian plans coming up? Um, no. I mean, there are conferences that I'm yes, looking forward you're, you're, to later March. in the year. You're, you're on the road in March. You want to you you plump that so you can say hi to our listeners in Dayton? Well, yes, I would love to uh, mention that. That's a wonderful conference. That is Holmes Doyle and Friends, and that is in beautiful downtown Dayton, Ohio on uh, the oh, it's at the end of the third week of March. It sort of begins on Friday the um, the 22nd in the evening and that's that weekend there, the weekend of Saturday the 23rd in Dayton, Ohio and I'm very happy to be out there with, with um, the gang and with Dan Andriaco and um, the team, I'm really looking forward to that. That'll be a lot of fun. And it's yeah. a great program. Even though I'm on it, it's a great program. No, come on. No. I've, I've been down there a couple of times and uh, was just delighted by uh, what they do there. And unfortunately, I'm not able to do it this time. It would be nice to take the show on the road with you, but uh, you're, you're going to have to go solo. Mm. I know you can do we it. We should take the show on the road. You know, We should do a live podcast. You know, if we could find a theater that was able to seat our seven <laughs> listeners, um, 
It would really be something. Like a classroom, maybe. Oh, well. tish tosh. Ah, uh, well. Well, we'll see. If, if there's some demand for it, maybe maybe we will. We will have a show, actually, in the future, not too long from now, uh, about another live event that's going on. So you'll, you'll want to hear about that. It's no, not one that we're putting on, but it is one that might be of interest. So mm. stay tuned for that. Well, in the meantime, this is the always recorded Scott Monty. <laughs> and I'm the frequently uh, noisy and skipping Burt Wolder. Remember, Burt, if you're not live, you're Memorex. Uh, and together, we say... The, the Games, games a Foot. <laughs> <laughs> the, the game's a foot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I'm neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.